Hi, I'm Jan. I'm from the group of Alexei Zelezniak, uh, here at Chalmers at the division SysBio. And I'll present um, my, my, the main project I've been working on uh, since I came here in uh, 2018. And this is uh, uh, regarding deep learning. Uh, so applying deep learning to learn the regulatory grammar in DNA um, and trying then to use these models to help with uh, protein expression engineering. Okay. So uh, why is this important? Uh, so understanding uh, the regulatory grammar of gene expression um, can help us to fine tune how cells function. And this is important for solving problems in both medicine and biotechnology. In the process of um, expression of DNA to RNA to protein, uh, multiple studies have shown that there is a strong agreement between protein abundance levels um, and also mRNA levels. So this suggests that transcription is actually a major determinant of protein abundance. So in our study, we actually just focused on transcription. So we obtained a, a huge data set of um, practically all available RNA sequencing experiments at that time, which covered also the majority of experimental conditions. And this data is uh, plotted um, in, this, in this figure. Um, on the x-axis, we have the transcripts per million, block TPM. And on the y-axis, the protein coding genes, which are sorted according to their median expression level. Um, so what we see here is that um, the variation of gene expression per each gene is actually much smaller than the whole dynamic range of expression levels that we have in our data set. It shows that actually these um, expression levels per gene are quite well conserved across all the different conditions, uh, meaning that the genes that are highly expressed um, in one condition will likely be highly expressed in others as well as vice versa for low ones. Uh, but this also suggests that actually uh, this phenomenon is likely encoded, at least these basal average gene expression levels are likely encoded in the DNA sequence itself. So I wanna talk a little bit more then about what this means, how this is encoded in DNA sequence. So here we have um, a gene structure, or as we define it, a gene regulatory structure. So uh, the CDS, the coding, coding regions, uh, so the coding sequence of the gene, and um, also then different regulatory regions, which are promoter, untranslated regions, as well as, as well as terminator region. And all of these are actually involved in the, the three different uh, steps of the process of transcription, which are initiation, elongation, and termination. And of course, it's well known that these regions carry a lot of regulatory uh, signals, so DNA sequence motifs, for instance, trans transcription factor binding sites in promoters, um, COSEC sequences in five prime uh, untranslated regions, as well as some additional um, three prime processing elements um, actually related to termination of transcription. And on top of this, we have the um, codon usage, so optimization codon optimality. So uh, different codon usage uh, with different genes, as well as the nucleosome positioning code, which is actually important across all of these regions as it defines the accessibility of the DNA for enzymatic processing, um, especially with the RNA polymerase. So we see that there is actually a rich, uh, rich uh, regulatory grammar that we would need to model in order to be able to, to test if we can predict, predict these expression levels um, merely from the DNA sequence. So luckily um, in the past years, there's been a lot of development of these this, uh, deep neural networks. And here we have a motivational example. So a very complex image uh, that a stack of two different types of neural networks is able to, first of all, decipher so decode what is going on in the image and then translate this into human understandable language. And these same networks, uh, which are convolutional networks and recurrent networks, can also be used for DNA sequence analysis. So the way convolutional networks work is they, they scan a receptive field um, and actually learn um, different, different motives which are important um, or which make up this image, or in our case, the DNA sequence. Um, and recurrent networks um, can then learn, learn the sequential information in the DNA, such as uh, different positioning of motifs um, and such things. But uh, the problem is with recurrent networks that they are very hard to train compared to convolutional ones. And uh, actually with certain tweaks, convolutional networks um, can achieve similar results as recurrent networks. So in the end, we just used convolutional uh, stacks of convolutional networks, so three, net three convolutional networks, um, with uh, two dense layers on top. So we were training um, 
deep models uh, to predict these target variables, which were the medium expression levels. Um, and we use as input data, of course, this um, as much as we could uh, um, the, the, uh, of this gene regulatory structure that we defined, which included over 2,000 base pairs of DNA sequence. So um, this was defined actually by testing with shorter, shorter um, sequence sizes of these regions. And we found that this gave the optimal results, but we were also limited a bit by the size of the model. So this was a good trade-off. Um, and we also then used um, the codon frequencies from the coding regions, as well as uh, variables related to mRNA stability. So from what is known in literature, the, all of the important information for predicting gene expression levels. Um, and of course, first we built models uh, with data from yeast. So this, this figure is also based on, on data for yeast for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and we, with this, we obtained models that could explain over 82% of the variation of gene expression levels in the testing data set. Um, so we wanted to test this further um, with different model organisms. So we then built models so, and performed all this data parsing and uh, model training with, um, with model organisms spanning from bacteria to human. So um, a wide range of different uh, genomic complexities as well as regulatory complexities. And we see that on average, 60% um, um, of the gene expression levels are, um, so 60% of the variation of gene expression levels actually um, explained by these models across all of these different model organisms um, of varying complexities. So we, we then further tested the yeast model um, first of all, comparing it to shallow, so comparing deep modeling approach to shallow classical machine learning models. And the important thing we found is that um, the, the main improvement of the deep learning approach is actually um, that it can extract the information of, from the DNA sequence itself. So it can learn the important uh, representations of the data. Um, so the motives, the, the regulatory grammar by itself. Whereas with shallow models, we need to actually um, give them a certain representation of the data, and usually camera frequencies are used for this. Um, and this has inherent limitations. Um, we then next tested uh, how different regulatory regions or combination of these actually affect um, the, the prediction of expression levels. And we found that um, each, each region actually carries, so that all regions actually jointly contribute to uh, prediction of expression levels, and each region carries um, a certain amount of overlapping as well as a certain amount of new orthogonal information relative to the other regions. And then we tested this a bit further uh, by analyzing the mutation rates across um, 14 orthologous yeast species. So there are orthologous genes, um, 14 related yeast species. Um, and we found that, uh, so we measured a medium level of correlation, which gave quite uh, strong evidence actually that there is, um, uh, so that um, these regulatory regions, especially promoters and terminators, co-evolve with their coding regions. So what this shows is that um, this gene regulatory structure is actually um, not only interacting across the different regions, but is actually a co-evolving unit. So next we wanted to test uh, what is the actual regulatory grammar. So what are these models learning? Uh, what type of regulatory grammar are they extracting from the DNA sequence? And for this, we used um, a quite pretty straightforward approach, which was actually to occlude um, with sliding windows all the input data and then measure, measure the perturbations this has on the predict predictions of the output um, of the models. And we measured uh, thus a relevance score which show the importance of each of these um, small occlusions um, for the model. And from this relevance uh, profiles, we could then um, mine and actually reconstruct uh, the DNA sequence motifs, so the regulatory grammar. And we found that indeed, um, this reconstructed motifs actually cover a large amount of the known yeast um, regulatory grammar, spanning uh, all these transcription factor binding sites and additional motifs across all of these different regions. Um, showing that actually the models seem to learn all of this, plus some additional new grammar. Um, and so we wanted, to, we wanted then to analyze uh, this a bit further. So we used association rule mining, uh, which is uh, used in market basket research, market basket analysis, um, and where we treated, each, so each gene was actually treated as a, as a basket of motives, 
and we wanted to extract uh, the motif co-occurrences across the genes. And here we see, for instance, um, a plot of the amounts of different co-occurring motifs. And we see that there is a large, so over eightfold increase um, in the um, amount of co-occurring motifs across all the different regions than in any single region alone. So they tend to co-occur across all this, this whole gene regulatory structure. And here is an example um, with four genes that share a, a common transcription factor binding site, so an NHP6B marked blue. And they carry then additional motifs um, marked red, which, uh, with which this transcription factor binding site co-occurs. Uh, which actually these red motives define or re, um, actually uh, define the expression levels um, with this uh, uh, transcription factor binding site over a large range of different expression levels, um, practically three orders of magnitude. So we then asked, okay, so from the whole range of expression levels in our data over four orders of magnitude, how much we can actually retrieve uh, by using, by analyzing motives or these motive co-occurrence rules. And we see that whereas with motives, we can extract 57% um, of the retrieve, so we can retrieve 57% of this whole range of expression levels. With motive co-occurrences, we can retrieve actually 84%. So basically the motive co-occurrence rules seem to be the most important part of this regulatory grammar of yeast. Um, and they define practically the whole range of expression levels. So finally, uh, we then asked if we can use these models of the learned regulatory grammar uh, to somehow um, guide or help with gene expression engineering. So first of all, um, to consider how people actually usually approach this is when they wanna fine tune the expression levels of certain gene, they just usually focus on a certain region like the promoter and they swap it out with a known weak or strong variant uh, without considering any of the other regions uh, which we showed can have quite a large effect on these interaction effects. Um, so we tested this computationally. Uh, of course, we had the models. So we um, used, uh, so we just kept the promoters fixed uh, with the different genes and then varied the terminator regions with all the different variants in our data set, which gave 18 million combinations, so 18 million different constructs to test. And what we find is that uh, for each gene, there's actually a large amount of regulatory freedom over two orders of magnitude um, around its native uh, expression levels, which can be unlocked just by swapping out these uh, different terminator regions. And so uh, promoters, for instance, that are weak can be made to be stronger and uh, vice versa, strong ones can be made to be uh, weaker. And also when we kept the uh, terminators fixed and then varied the different, uh, so with different promoters, uh, we obtain very similar results. So we wanted to test this experimentally and we designed uh, new constructs. Here we had to replace the genes with GFP, of course, to measure the fluorescence. So we chose native promoters that spanned uh, relatively, um, so, so that span from relatively low to relatively higher expression levels, so a certain range. Um, and then also chose, based on predictions, uh, terminators that were strong or weak, so that could either upregulate or downregulate the expression levels of these promoter, this promoters or these constructs. And we see that uh, we achieved actually quite good correlation between um, predictions and actual measured fluorescence intensities, so um, correlation of approximately 0.65. Um, and uh, here on this image, we see the relative change then of the gene expression replacing terminators um, of, with, the, so with the weak and strong terminators um, relative to the native ones. So, so just a percent change. And on average, uh, we see that we can drive expression levels uh, approximately 20% up or down uh, by swapping out the terminators, as well as we can achieve certain constructs that have a much larger change. So it's good also for finding some completely new combinations. So what this shows is that um, we can learn uh, we can build models of this regulatory grammar just by learning from the native genomes. Um, and uh, this can be used then to guide gene expression engineering without a requirement for any um, synthetic approaches, which can be costly and time consuming. 